Hello and welcome to the first of four presentations in our CIA concussion series. I want to take a moment to thank our platinum sponsors, PIA Law, the sponsors of our CIA concussions, CIR concussion series. Representing the PIA this evening is Laura Fitzgerald Ruschek. Laura is also uh, a board member at FIST and a very proud one. Laura completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto in Ethics, Society and Law and International Relations. She obtained her Juris Doctor and Masters of Public Administrations at Queen University and also completed her International Business Law Program at the Vader International Study Center in England. Laura was called to the bar in 2013. Laura joined Ole Vigmund after practicing insurance defense at a leading national firm. Her experience of representing many of Canada's largest insurers has provided Laura with valuable insight into personal injury claims, allowing her to be to better serve her clients. Laura's practice focuses solely on personal injury law, including motor vehicle accidents, accident benefits, medical mal malpractice, occupier's liability, and product liability cases. For Laura, the most rewarding aspect of her work is helping clients achieve the best possible outcomes. When Laura is not practicing personal injury, she enjoys spending time outdoors and amateur scuba diving. Welcome, Laura. Thanks so much, Melissa. And I am pleased to introduce uh, Sean Gargoon. Sean is a board certified chiropractor, having graduated from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College with cum laude distinction and clinic honors. Before attending chiropractic school, Sean attended the University of Western Ontario, where he earned an honors Bachelor of Arts in kinesiology while maintaining Dean's List status, which is a fantastic achievement. <laughs> I'm, that's me adding it, not on Sean's bio. Sean is a diversified practitioner, providing treatment consisting of myofascial release, chiropractic adjustments, exercise prescription, nutritional counseling, and neurofunctional acupuncture. Sean has taken additional certification in the management of concussion, and he's currently completing his Master's of Rehabilitation Science at the University of McMaster. So thank you so much for joining us this evening, Sean. Thank you very much, Laura. I appreciate the kind words, and hello to everybody out there attending as well. Um, so this is my, I believe my third or my fourth year doing this talk, and it's always one of my favorite times of the year. Uh, I, I love giving this presentation, although I do give it a, a number of times throughout the year. I love giving it to this group because uh, I find it's very well received and, you know, we get on pretty well. It's a little different the past two years, obviously, uh, with things being virtual, but uh, nonetheless, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, just as Melissa said, I, if anybody has any questions, please pop them into the chat or the Q&A below and we can get to them at the end. Um, the presentation, I typically uh, find I talk too much, so hopefully it's not too long for you guys, but the presentation will likely be around an hour. I'm going to stop in the middle for a bit of a screen break because I know some of our members need that uh, for about five minutes or so. And then, like I said, we'll do the questions at the end. Um, and so let me share my screen, my presentation. Okay, and I trust that everybody can see that. Okay, so this is, thanks, yeah. This is the best concussion series, like uh, Laura introduced. I am Sean, I'm a chiropractor with Complex Injury Rehab. We're a specialized clinic dealing primarily with brain and neurological type injuries, and we're located in Pickering, although we do have uh, a few more satellite locations located around the GTA and up to Barrie. Uh, I am actually located primarily at the Pickering location. Though. Okay, so this series, just uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of things, uh, the aim of the series is, is to provide evidence-based information. So uh, if anybody has previously suffered a concussion type injury or has a loved one that has a concussion injury, uh, they know that the, the field is very murky and lots of misinformation out there, whether it's, you know, through Dr. Google or the internet, or, you know, unfortunately, sometimes with some of the family physicians, we see a lot of uh, mismanagement, misinformation, or just a lack of understanding. So the goal of this is to provide uh, evidence-based information. What does the literature tell us? What does the research tell us? Because I think we can often fall 
onto that when we're unsure about something. Um, and also to provide some strategies for self-management in the case of both acute and post-concussive syndrome uh, patients. My talk today is going to be concussion 101, essentially. So we're going to talk about what a concussion actually is, because surprisingly, a lot of patients that suffer this injury aren't 100% sure on what a concussion is. So uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit of science. We're not going to get too complicated, but just so you have a base level understanding of that. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about PCS or post-concussive type syndrome and the origins of that. Uh, and then, like I said, we'll have some, some questions at the end. I will also be giving a talk about nutrition and exercise interventions. That will be the fourth session of, uh, or sorry, the fourth webinar, I believe. So in a few weeks time, I have a colleague who is a OT who is going to be talking about pacing, planning and fatigue management strategies. And a colleague who is a social worker um, who's talking about self-advocacy and other uh, community types of resources. So the nice thing is that you're gonna get perspectives from three different healthcare professionals. Um, and really uh, the way that I look at concussion is there's sort of three buckets that fall into the concussion injury. One being physical, one being cognitive, and one being the psycho-emotional slash mental health bucket. And with our three professions, you're kind of getting somebody that represents each one of those buckets. So it's a nice, well-rounded presentation we hope for you. Just quickly, logistically, so there's going to be four sessions. They're Monday nights, uh, 6 to about 7.30 or so. We have locked off, so an hour and a half and with a, a short break. Format is going to be kind of lecture-driven uh, like this. And then ideally, if we're in person, it makes it a little bit easier for having a discussion or uh, it being interactive. So it's a little bit harder with this. But at the end, we'll, we will do some questions. Um, and just to be upfront, I'm recovering from a little bit of a back injury. So if you see me kind of wiggling around a little bit, I, I hope it's not too distracting, but that's, uh, that's me. Uh, a few caveats here, just uh, some guidelines for the group. Um, so this is purely educational. Okay. I, I know it's, if we want to share personal experiences at the end, or if you have personal questions, that's fine. Uh, but keep in mind that, you know, I, I'm not providing any sort of diagnosis. I'm giving recommendations on some, some self-help uh, or self-management strategies, but I'm not doing any treatment in here. Uh, this is not the type of space for, for that. You know, it, it would require a, a complex assessment and personalized and tailored treatment plan. And so that's just not possible over something like this. We want to aim to be constructive to uh, one another, not destructive. Everybody experiences these injuries in a far different way. There might be some similarities, some things that work for others and not for others. Um, so let's just keep that in mind. And then obviously, you know, we're going to be as confidential and, and private as, po uh, as possible with this. All right, so we can get started here. So concussion 101, everything we need to know about concussion. So I'd like to start this with um, posing or posing these questions to everybody. And hopefully throughout the lecture, we can answer some of these. We're gonna come back to these at the end. So keep an eye out for any information you think would help you. So for a concussion, do you have to be hit in the head for a concussion injury to happen? Do you need to have a loss of consciousness or an LOC? Do, cushion, do concussions show up on X-ray, CT or MRI? Is there a blood test to confirm a concussion? And finally, can a helmet or a mouth guard prevent a concussion? So some of you may know these answers already and that's great. We can you know, talk at the end. If you don't, then please uh, stay tuned and we'll see if we can answer them for you. Okay, so just uh, some base level stats um, about concussions. So MVA stands for motor vehicle accidents. So there's typically, uh, some of these stats are American. I, I tried to pick cherry pick ones that would be close to Canada, but uh, approximately 240,000 motor vehicle accidents per year and one in 61 results in a concussion, okay? And I'll talk about reporting of these numbers in a second, but just uh, these are straight from some uh, journal articles and from literature as well. So in the workplace, there was a, a research paper that brought about almost 20 out of 100,000 male workers would suffer a concussion. From war, almost 15% of returning veterans would have suffered a concussion. And there's an estimated three, almost 4 million sports-related concussion, which is what SRC stands for per year. 
and that's approximately a $56 billion cost to the health healthcare system. So this is an American stat. So, you know, there's more people down there, but still that is a, a gigantic number when we look at the cost. 10% um, of all athletes in contact sports. And here's what I want to talk about is the reported versus the actual numbers. So uh, I'm sure if anybody has experience in the concussion world, concussions, you've seen that concussions can be difficult to diagnose. Right. It's there's just starting to be some some more firm and concrete ways of diagnosing these these injuries, um, which are difficult to access. So previously it was a purely clinical diagnosis, meaning it was made just within a clinic. Um, somebody put a patient through an assessment and would make the concussion diagnosis based off of that, as opposed to having an image or, or a test that would tell us. Um, and so because of that, there's a lot of interpretation. So whether it's the doctor's interpretation doing the assessment, whether it's the patient's interpretation of their symptoms or how they're feeling, maybe, you know, you have somebody who likes to quote unquote, tough it out. And, and so they don't tell anybody about their symptoms. Um, so it makes it very difficult to get concrete numbers because of that. Um, and my last point there actually speaks to that. It's called the culture or what's known as the culture of sport. So in a lot of sports, um, especially pro sports, a little bit more than amateur sports, but more than 50% are actually never reported. And the reason of this is that, like I was just saying, a lot of people try to tough it out and keep playing. If we think about it in sport, in professional sports, it's a very unforgiving world. And if somebody cannot play because they are injured, then basically they will just find the next person to fill that spot. And when it's you know, their, their livelihood. And when it's, you know, a, a paycheck and they're relying on that for their family, a lot of people try to hide those symptoms because they, they can't afford to be out of work, obviously, like a lot of people. So that's what causes a few issues with reporting these numbers. So you have to always take that into account when you're looking at um, statistics of, of the incidence rates. The highest concussion rates in sports. So some of the obvious ones, football, obviously very high impact and people strap a helmet on and torpedo themselves at each other. So that's an easy one. Hockey, again, you're moving at pretty high speeds uh, on the ice and, and hurling yourself around. Rugby, um, I was a former rugby player and uh, I suffered a few concussions. I think three or four diagnosed and I'm sure a number of others that weren't diagnosed. Um, and it's, it's surprisingly lower on the risk as far as uh, um, incidence rates, as opposed to some of the other sports, um, considering that there's no sort of equipment or anything like that, but it is a little bit lower. Lacrosse, again, because of the contact. And soccer is always the one that's a little bit surprising to some people um, because it's not typically thought of as a contact sport. There is the most common mechanism in soccer is when somebody's trying to go up to head the ball and somebody else is going to battle them for it and they either collide heads or they, they take an elbow to the head, something like that. So uh, soccer, especially uh, women's soccer is high on that list as well. And then if we look at this, ages 10 to 18, ER, the number of ER visits for sport related head injury, 39% of them were diagnosed with a concussion an additional 24 with a possible concussion. So quick math there, I believe that 63% could possibly have a concussion with um, any sort of sports related head injury, which is a gigantic number. That's huge, right? 63%, almost two thirds of uh, all head injuries, especially in a developing population like the 10 to 18 year old cohort. Uh, it's, it's obviously, you know, a pretty serious um, injury. Okay, so um, let's move into what a concussion actually is. So the sort of Bible of concussion uh, research is done by something called the CISG or the Concussion in Sport Group. And so this is the, a group of the experts in the world from all different countries, they all come together, they've all done their individual research, they come together every four years. Um, and they present what they've had, what they've done over the last year or last four years, sorry. And essentially what they do is they come to these consensus statements. And so they publish this. The last published one was 2017, <coughs> excuse me, um, which means we're due for one in the next, it should have been, I believe last year, um, but I think COVID had a little bit of a uh, hand in that delaying it. So we'll, we will, uh, hopefully just wait for the new one to come out. Although I'm sure there'll be minimal change because this, um, 
this last consensus statement was actually very well received. So basically what I wanted to highlight here, these are right from the article, the consensus statement, is what a concussion is according to the foremost experts in the world, okay? It's a little jargony, so I'll explain it, but um, let's go through them now. So uh, they state that concussion is a traumatic brain injury induced by biomechanical forces, so movement forces. Several common features that may be utilized in clinically defining the nature of a concussive head injury include, and so there's, I believe, five bullets here that they they state are part of a concussion. So it may be caused either by a direct blow to the head, face, neck, or elsewhere on the body with an impulsive force transmitted to the head. So somebody gets hit in the head, the face, the neck, that's obviously a pretty easy way of seeing how that injury could happen. However, if somebody, say we're talking about football, somebody gets hit into the side of their body with enough force that it translates to the head and allows for kind of this whipping mechanism of the head and the neck, that can also result in a concussion. So that just goes to show you that you don't only have to be hit in the head, you can be hit elsewhere. And oftentimes when somebody goes to say a walk-in clinic or their family physician or somebody who's just not as versed in the, the concussion world, that's usually one of the first questions is, did you get hit in the head? And, you know, they would say, well, if you didn't know, you don't have a concussion, then, which we know that not to be um, exactly true. Second, typically results in the rapid onset of short lived impairment of neurological function that resolves spontaneously. So typically in kind of your very standard vanilla run of the mill concussion, although, you know, they are rarely that um, the symptoms come on very rapidly and they're of a neurological nature, okay? So um, typically, they, you may have things like, you know, uh, a laceration or bruising or a fracture, but concussion symptoms are typically of a neuro nature, meaning it's caused by injury to neurological structures or nerves. Um, they can resolve very spontaneously um, in, like I said, the very vanilla type of concussion. However, in some cases, as it says here, signs and symptoms evolve over a number of minutes to hours. So they can progress um, and not only from minutes to hours, but then, you know, sometimes uh, in some people, we end up with a PCS or a long-term type um, of injury. Number three, so it may result in neuropathological changes, but the acute clinical signs and symptoms largely reflect a functional disturbance rather than a structural injury. And as such, no abnormality is seen on standard structural neuroimaging studies. So this is a huge point here because the fact that it is a functional injury versus a structural injury is my big take home point from this webinar. So let's talk about what a structural injury first is first. If I fall, I land on my hand, I break my arm, okay? I break the bone, one of the bones in my arm. I take an x-ray of that, the, my arm there, and I'm gonna see that it, there's a, a, a break. My, bro my bone is broken, there's a fracture there. That's what a structural injury, it's an actual injury to the structure of my body. A functional injury is more, you're not gonna see it on imaging because it is not a, it's not damaged to the structure. It's more of how the piece of your body, the part of your body is working. And that can be caused by things like, a energy crisis or an energy demand or uh, sorry an em energy drought where what we want to do isn't being met with enough energy to, to actually make that happen it can be caused by an imbalance in certain neurochemicals so if i take an x-ray of of my brain and it's my injury is not structural you're not going to see anything same with a ct or an mri mris are largely thought of as the gold standard in imaging and for the most part they are except it's still a, a 2D picture and it's non-moving. So you're not gonna see how things are working in there. So there are, like I alluded to earlier, there are some more advanced type imaging um, modalities now that you can actually see function and you can see a live moving image, but the traditional imaging modalities do not actually show us structural injuries. They don't show us fun, or sorry, they show us structural injuries. They don't show us function, okay? So a concussion is largely a functional disturbance, not a structural injury.
Number four, uh, results in a range of clinical signs and symptoms that may or may not involve loss of consciousness. This is, if there's a second point I want you to take home, it's this one, because this is always the question that is asked at a walk-in or a family physician um, with somebody who presents with a concussion. Did you black out? Did you lose consciousness? And traditionally, it's always been, no, I didn't lose consciousness. Oh, okay, well, then you don't have a concussion. And we know that's not true between 90 to 95% of concussion injuries actually result without a loss of consciousness, okay? So it's very important that we know that it may or may not involve that LOC. Resolution of the clinical and cognitive features typically follows a sequential course. However, in some cases, symptoms may be prolonged. So like I said, if we get kind of the very vanilla concussion um, and it is managed perfectly from the beginning, there's no complicating factors, Typically, we know how people are going to recover and we know when people are going to recover. And that window is usually between 22 to 28 days. Okay? It might be 22 to 30 days, depending on the research paper you read. But typically, that's the length of time that it takes for somebody to recover. However, in some cases, symptoms may be prolonged. And that's typically when we get past that point. That's when we go into what's called a post-concussive syndrome. And it, that can be caused by a number of things. It can be mismanagement at the outset of the injury. It can be some other complicating factors if there are pre-existing diagnoses, uh, if there's comorbidities, uh, a history of concussions as well, um, and a history of rapid and in succession. So in close time timing as well, that can cause a, a prolonged recovery. And then number five, the clinical signs and symptoms cannot be explained by drug, alcohol, or medication use, other injuries such as cervical injuries or um, neck injuries peripheral vestibular dysfunction, uh, sort of like inner ear or balance issues, or other comorbidities, psychological factors or coexisting medical conditions. So this is just to say that the injury is not as a result of any of these other explanations. It's, you know, we know that the concussion is from the actual impact injury that, that has occurred. And those lists of um, other factors there often are those complicating factors that I alluded to earlier that may cause a prolonged recovery rate. So I know that's a bit wordy. Um, I, I hopefully I was able to distill it down, but I think, like I said, the consensus from, from the experts in the world, I like to go over that because it actually explains what the concussion is. So I tried to, again, distill it down here. So simply put, concussion is a mild injury of the brain caused by physical force that results in mainly short-term, sometimes long-term functional impairments and is unexplained by other mechanisms of injury. The one thing I'll say is I know sometimes people take issue with the fact that it's called a mild injury of the brain and having suffered my own concussions, I know it's not always mild. That's more uh, medical jargon, so please don't take issue with that. Okay, so uh, here's where we're going to get into a little bit of the sciencey type stuff. I just, I really just want to show you a, a couple um, anatomical structures because it's going to help you again understand. We're going to talk about the theory of how the concussion happens, but in order to do that, we need to know a little bit about the brain. So this is our brain. This is a cross section of the brain. So we're kind of looking at it from the front on. Um, and really there's two areas or two terms I want you to look at. So there's gray matter and there's white matter. This is the, the two kind of uh, buckets that a lot of tissue in the brain can fall into. The difference between the two is that one has a certain protein called myelin and the other one does not. And myelin is primarily used for transmission of neurological impulses. Basically, it's a, it helps to pass the, the electricity through our brain um, and create or pass along the signals of what we want to do or think or, or um, whatever it is that our brain is, is uh, trying to put into motion. There. Okay, so gray and white matter, one has a certain protein and one doesn't. And because one has a certain protein, that actually means that it's a little bit of a denser matter than the other. This is the other little piece of anatomy we're going to look at here. So this is the neuron or this is basically a, a nerve cell or the functional unit of the brain. So we have millions, billions of these, especially in our brain, there's a high concentration there. You can see the direction that the mes message travels. Okay, so the nucleus is thought of as like the center of the neuron or any cell for that matter. 
There's the myelin sheaths if you look at the middle right there. So these little nodules help to pass along information from one to the next and so on and so on. They speed it up very quickly. And that's how we're able to think and perform the action within you know a tenth of a millisecond kind of thing. So the, the message travels from the nucleus down the axon through the myelin sheaths to the axon terminals. And then from here, neurons are arranged like this. And so this is how we're able to pass messages from one neuron to the next and so on and so on. Okay, so keeping those in mind, let's talk about how a concussion happens. So right now we're, we still just have concussion theories, okay? A lot of science is very theoretical based, meaning that we don't have concrete answers right now, but we have the best answers available. And like I said, this is what the research shows. And so, when we're unsure about things, we can fall back to what the research tells us because that is the best answer that we have right now. And so I graduated from university in 2010 from Western, and I had learned that a concussion, the theory of concussion at the time was the coup contra coup theory, which is number one here. And that it was a brain bruise. So essentially your brain is this hard shell Sorry, your skull is this hard shell. Your brain is this kind of jelly-like substance in the middle. When you get hit, if you bump your head, what happens is that your brain slams into the front of your hard shell uh, skull. You get this whiplash-like motion where the brain slams into the back of your, this hard shell that is your skull, and you end up with a brain bruise. So based on some of the things we've talked about, can anybody see what the issue is with that? Is that if we end up with a brain bruise, the big issue is that if there was this bruise like structure on your brain and we took an MRI of it, we would be able to see it, right? The same way that you'd be able to see the bruise on your arm or the bruise on your knee or whatever it is, because that is largely reflect a reflection of a structural injury. But now that we know, and everybody else here knows that it's not a structural injury, but rather a functional injury. That kind of immediately disproves this theory. This doesn't make any sense. And so the accepted theory um, nowadays is this acceleration deceleration theory or what's called often called the stretch and shear theory. And the reason why we were talking about brain matter densities between the gray and the white is because when things are different densities, just according to the laws of physics, they will accelerate and they will decelerate at different rates or they will speed up and slow down at different rates. And so what that causes is this sort of shearing mechanism between the two matters in the brain, between the gray and the white matter. And so it's not so much that it causes a stretching, a shearing and a tearing, because that would again largely reflect a structural injury. But what it does is this stretching and shearing mechanism actually causes a, um, a lot of the functional processes in the brain to become dysfunctional or work improperly, okay? And so when it says injures brain cells there, I actually should change that terminology because it doesn't actually injure the structural brain cell. It can, okay, but in, I would say, a very high degree or a high number of concussion injuries, it doesn't. It actually just injures or it causes dysfunction of the brain cell activity. I hope everybody understands that. So there's two phases to this stretch and shear uh, mechanism or, or this theory. And one is what's called the excitatory phase and one is what's called spreading depression. So let's talk about those uh, as well. So the excitatory phase is that initial kind of what they estimate up to 15 minutes of the injury, okay? So it's this stretching and shearing of the brain matter or the white and the gray matter in your head causes a huge neuronal activity. So the two neurons that we saw side by each that were talking to each other, this causes all a, a huge activation of a whole bunch of them in the brain. And, and it can vary depending on what part of the brain is affected. Uh, and that can change the response. I, you, you can see there in, in quotations, basically it's like you turn all the switches on at once in a certain region of the brain. This is where you see the kind of typical initial symptoms of a concussion, seeing stars, right? Or like the old cartoons when there's, you know, Tweety birds going around somebody's head, um, a, loss is, a loss of consciousness, speaking gibberish, right? They may, they may have, uh, they may respond to questions in a very strange or weird way. 
um, inappropriate emotional responses, laughing or crying. I saw this a number of times when I was a rugby player on the field. Somebody would get hit, they'd stand up and they would start laughing and it would be, you know, a little harrowing, a little odd to see, but it's, it's not, it wasn't their uh, intention. It was just the way that their brain had responded. Fencer's response. I don't know. Again, I, I'm relating everything to sport because I have a history in sport, but also we see a lot of these injuries in sports. But a fencer's response, if anybody has seen any sort of um, like combat sports or again with football or rugby, a, a fencer's response is, is when somebody loses consciousness, but they have a limb, typically an arm or a leg goes very rigid and it goes almost lifts up in the air. And people often think it's a, a seizure happening which it can be, but most of the time it's what's called a fencer's response. And it's this, this really rigid extremity that goes up in the air. So these are largely the result of this huge neuronal activity in the brain. Um, and like I said, it, it can depend uh, what we see just depending on where the, the injury happens in the brain. So the second phase of this, of the acceleration deceleration theory is what's called spreading depression. And this is where we get those kind of typical long-term concussion symptoms. So again, usually this can last up to 22 to 30 days unless we start to enter PCS territory. But the reason behind this is that we have a sort of energy crisis. So when we have that stretch and shear, uh, we we create this dysfunctional activity in the brain where we turn everything on. We've used so much energy to do that, and it requires energy or ATP, which is our body's energy source. Um, we require energy to reverse that excitatory phase. And that's without getting too in depth, that looks like trying to reverse certain um, ion channels in the brain we, that cause active activation of neurons and activation of different uh, areas of the brain. Uh, and that's where it says right there, neurochemical ion imbalance. So some of the neurochemicals in our brain become imbalanced because of this, this activation that disrupts the energy production in our brain because things happen largely in a chain fashion in our brain. If we don't have A, we can't have B and can't have C and so on. And basically we're at this point where we have this crisis. The energy demand required to reverse the excitatory phase is not being met by the production of, of ATP or energy. And that equals this crisis. And so this is where we start to get some of those long-term or not long-term, but longer symptoms, the kind of persistent low-grade headache, um, light or sound sensitivity, photophono sensitivity, the, the huge amount of fatigue, heightened emotional states, irritability, anxiousness, lar uh, large amounts of stress and inability to, to deal with stress. Some of the cognitive symptoms like decreased attention, decreased concentration, mental fog, poor short-term, long-term uh, memory function, tinnitus or the ringing in our ears, and sleep disturbances. So we're just not able to keep up with the demands uh, to reverse the stretch shear mechanism because we've, we've created this dysfunctional mechanism in our brain and in our head. So those are the two phases of acceleration, deceleration injury, and what is now commonly the accepted theory of concussion injuries. Like I said, functional injury, not a structural injury. Okay, so I figured now we could just take a few minutes break. Uh, if you need just, it's 637 according to my watch. I figure we'll just do three minutes or so, rest your eyes, and then we'll come back to this. Okay, good. So a little bit of a break, give your eyes a bit of a break and give my voice a bit of a break there too. So let's carry on. Here. Okay, so we just finished speaking about the um, theories of how a concussion happens. And while a concussion can happen with a impulse or impact to any part of the body, normally what we do see, and I don't have the exact figures in, in front of me or you know, off the top of my head, but anecdotally, what I see is most injuries happen with a force uh, or an impulse to the head. And now our head is obviously supported by our cervical spine or our neck. And so it's a very important area of the body to look at as well in relation to concussion injuries, because um, a lot of symptoms experienced can actually 
be as a result of injury to the cervical spine as well. Being a chiropractor, while I'm not, I don't really treat like the textbook chiropractor, any part of the, the spine is obviously near and dear to my heart. So we're going to talk about this a little bit as well. So the cervical spine or the neck, same thing. Um, just to clarify that. Let's talk about some forces of injuries and some numbers here. So <clears throat> concussion injuries, this is through some uh, maybe not the nicest uh, research papers done through rat modeling and rat studies, but they were actually able to figure and extrapolate um, and uh, infer from these studies that concussions actually typically happen with forces of 70 to 120 Gs, uh, which is the force of gravity. So that's usually what the impact is required to cause a concussion injury. With whiplash to the neck, it's only four and a half Gs usually. And so what does that tell us? Uh, that with 99.9% you know, .9 of concussions, you're likely going to have a whiplash mechanism involved and therefore a cervical spine or a neck injury involved as well. So it's very important that you look at the neck and at least clear the neck if that's not a focus for, for treatment. So cervical whiplash mechanism of injury, we, we know what whiplash looks like. The classic whiplash, like as if you're being rear-ended in a car is where you know we get hit, our head goes one way and we get that whipping type motion where it goes the other way. And so that usually leads to a sprain strain type injury. We strain muscles and we sprain joints. So usually what ends up happening is that we strain some of the muscles of the neck and there's some specific ones through there that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, and we can also sprain the joints of the neck. Um, so that's more of a phys the physical uh, result of a whiplash, but it can also lead to central nervous system dysfunction. That's what CNS means, or basically our central nervous system is our brain and our spinal cord. It can lead to some dysfunction there. Um, one of the ways is through something called the sympathetic ganglion, which again, we're going to talk about in a little bit. There's a, a couple other science type terms there, so we'll, we'll explain them there. So one of the easiest and one of the actually the most common things that I see with uh, concussion patients is what are called muscular referral patterns. So these two researchers named Trevell and Simons, two very smart people, they did a uh, research study where they were actually able to map out what a referral pattern is. And so a referral pattern is, you know, maybe you the actual injury or dysfunction is in one area, but you feel the pain in another area. And so a lot of therapists, whether they're physios, chiros, massage, osteos, whatever they are, they are, sometimes they will get um, caught up in treating the painful area when that's just sort of the alarm and not the actual source of, of the pain. And so that's these referral patterns are often um, great mimickers because of that. So if we look at, at these pictures here, the X's are the basically X marks the spot as far as the dysfunction in the muscles there. And the red is where the people in the research study experience the pain. So suboccipital is very, very commonly injured in any sort of whiplash injury. They're kind of the small muscles right beneath the, the base of the skull, the top of the neck. Um, this actually very often produces sort of what I call a question mark pattern as far as a headache. So kind of up the back of the head, round the ear and to the temples. Splenius capitis, again, sort of in that, that spot right below the, the skull and the top of the neck. This often causes a, a headache or pain at the crown of the neck. Sorry, crown of the head, right on top. SCM, the sternocleidomastoid, is this the big one in the front of the neck that sticks out when you turn your head. Uh, and you can see here, depending on which part of it, you know, it causes that pain at the back of the head or around the eye. Um, around the forehead. Trapezius is our big shoulder uh, bulk right at the top here. And that causes, again, pain in a number of spots and even to the jaw with this one, right? So what I want you to look at with this is that what the locations of these headaches are often spots of complaint for a concussion patient. You know, the, the classic concussion of being right at the temples across the forehead, almost behind the eyes, you just want to take a melon scooper or melon baller and just go behind your eyes and scoop it out. That can very often be related to some of these um, muscular points. Okay? 
patients come in and I assess them and I poke around in there and I, I actually say to them, look, I'm going to press and hold this muscle here and I want you to tell me what you feel. I ask them that way so I don't lead them. If, if I say, yeah, uh, tell me, do you feel pain behind your eyes? Of course, 90% of people will say yes. But I just say, tell me what you feel. And I press and hold. And they say, oh my goodness, I feel my headache. I feel pain behind my eyes. I feel pressure behind my eyes. I feel that fatigue sensation behind my eyes. Okay, It's not always the time, but a lot of times it's amazing how much involvement that these muscles have in causing what is often felt as, you know, or associated with, with just a concussion type headache. So it's very important that whatever therapist, whatever uh, healthcare practitioner you're seeing addresses the cervical spine because of this. Cervical spine ganglia. So a ganglia is basically a grouping of nerves. Um, you may have heard of this in like a ganglion cyst. A lot of people have gang ganglion cysts kind of right at the back of their wrist. Um, basically it's a, a ganglia is a group of nerves. They're, they're kind of hubs, let's call them. Um, in the neck, there is a few of them, um, but the one that I really want to speak about is what's called the superior cervical ganglion. So basically superior meaning the uppermost. And you can see on that picture there, there's a little red star. And so it's between that C2, C3 uh, vertebrae in the neck. Okay, So basically the, the upper area of the neck. Um, these ganglions are, are hubs for nerve transmission. This one in particular has relations to the following functions muscular function, so activation, tension, tightness, that sort of thing. Uh, it, it can affect our sleep-wake cycle. It can affect our pupil and our eye function. It can affect our balance and our vestibular system and potentially cerebrospinal fluid production, although the research is equivocal on that. But if we look at those first four, those are often areas of dysfunction in a concussion patient. Muscle function, sure, muscle pain, right? Sleep-wake cycle, very commonly reported. I have difficulty uh, either falling asleep or I have a very restless sleep and I wake up exhausted. Uh, pupil or eye function, I have blurry vision, I have double vision, I have fatigue in my eyes. Balance or vestibular system, you know, very commonly seen where people have uh, difficulty with um, balance or they feel very unsteady. Again, they feel dizzy. So is it going to be related to this? It may, it's not, I can't, you know, say with certainty, but I think it's important that we look to an area like this um, because, uh, and again, clear the neck because this area can, can affect this, the cervical ganglia, which can affect those other symptoms as well, okay? And I think it's important to say that uh, we have to look, like I said at the beginning, I spoke about the three buckets of concussion being physical, cognitive, and psychoemotional or mental health. We have to look at all of them because if we only address one, then you will get better to a certain degree, but you won't have resolution. And that's very much the same if we drill down the physical bucket. If we just deal with the neck, if we just deal with the vision or the vestibular part, you will improve, but likely not full resolution. We have to look at all these areas. We have to at least assess them and clear them. Um, because often there's, there's multiple contributors or multiple of these, uh, these areas that uh, contribute to a concussion type injury. So that's the, the cervical spine ganglia. And then quickly, I just wanted to talk about uh, PCS because I know um, this is in about 30 to 40% of people with a acute concussion, they end up with post-concussive syndrome. And, um, the according to the ICD-10, which is kind of a, a book as far as diagnosis, post-concussive syndrome, you have to have at least three of the following four weeks post-injury. So it can't be within that acute phase or that subacute phase. It has to start getting into sort of the chronic type uh, phase of an injury. So headache, fatigue, dizziness, memory issues, irritability, sleep issues, concentration issues, stress, emotional issues. They're pretty vague for the most part. Um, and that's because I think at this point, when we start getting into the chronic type issues, people largely um, have very different experiences. And I think, um, you know, you may have all of these, you may only have a couple of them. According to the ICD-10, you have to have three, but I don't know how much I agree with that, but this is what it says in the textbook, essentially. The tricky thing with PCS is that the exact pathology is unknown or how it happens is unknown. Um, there's again, lots of theories. 
And I'm going to go through a few of them and uh, I'll give you my theory kind of at the end of, uh, of them all. But um, we, this is what makes it very tricky to treat is that we don't know the exact reason a lot of people feel these, uh, or, or sorry, the exact reason why a lot of people experience um, PCS. 30 to 40% of all concussion patients. And here are the six theories of, of PCS. So altered blood flow. Um, so again, in sort of rat in rat models, it was shown that immediately after a mild to moderate brain injury, there's up to 50% reduction in brain blood flow. So this is cerebrovascular blood flow is the term for that. Um, and so there's a way to test this. And this is actually something I talk about in the exercise uh, lecture that I give. Uh, but typically what you'll see is that your signs and symptoms will return when you're doing something physically, especially with cardiovascular output. If you do any sort of cardiovascular exercise or task, you're, you're obviously going to increase your heart rate, which increases your systemic blood flow or overall blood flow, which includes the brain. And so if we can sort of relate the PCS symptoms to increased blood flow to the brain, and then that could be a source or the origin of your PCS. Number two is metabolic or inflammatory uh, origins. So metabolic, meaning we spoke about the energy crisis that ends up happening. So uh, it could be ongoing effects of that. And this is likely to have more likely to happen if somebody has a me metabolic disorder uh, in the first place, one of those complicating factors. Um, it's more likely with uh, if you have limited initial rest after a concussion, this is where sort of the acute management piece comes because ideally the latest literature actually says that after the injury happens, 24 to 48 hours max of rest is advised, which varies, varies greatly compared to what a lot of family physicians are saying as far as take two weeks off. But if we, do have um, uh, uh, improper management right off the hop, then sometimes these metabolic issues uh, will arise. And then the inflammatory origin as well. So almost this cyclical process of inflammation causes inflammation. So we have the stretch and shear mechanism that causes the inflammatory response from the body, which causes more of an inflammatory response because now your brain is trying to remedy a situation where um, it, it can't fix because it doesn't have the enough energy. Uh, it doesn't have enough energy to meet the demands. And so it's kind of this cyclical process where inflammation causes inflammation into ongoing. Visual vestibular dysfunction. So 70% of concussion patients will have a visual or a balance issue. Um, and this can be seen as far as like visual processing. So um, blurred vision, double vision, Oftentimes people will report difficulty with reading. They can't keep track of the line that they were on, on a, on a, in a book or words are disappearing when they're looking. Um, proprioception, which is essentially our body's awareness of itself in space. So maybe we go to reach for a cup and we actually overshoot it or we undershoot it. Uh, we're not able to, to you know, accurately um, decide how much force or how little force to use with a body part. Uh, balance or vestibular issues. So typically related to the vestibular system, the, the canals of our ears and the fluid within our ears. Um, and so this, these end up happening in about 70% of concussion patients. So that could be, you know, if this is not addressed in the initial management, this could be uh, one of the origins of PCS. Number four, so cervical spine dysfunction. So just as we had talked, uh, if nobody is looking at the cervical spine, then that could lead to unaddressed areas and then prolonged duration of uh, PCS, obviously. And just a little caveat there, facial pain. Sometimes people complain of pain like through the face, through the cheeks, through the teeth. Sometimes it can be a specific nerve called the trigeminal nerve because it actually interacts with your, your neck as well. Psychological. So there is that psychological element to this as well. Um, and I would say that it says always includes a psychological component as far as PCS. I don't like absolutes using the term always, but in again, in 95% of PCS uh, patients, I would see that there's a psychological component for a couple of different reasons. So whether if they've had previously diagnosed um, anxiety or depression or any other sort of mood disorder, there is actually literature that, that 
supports the idea that that increases the risk of PCS. So that is one thing. The other thing is with a concussion injury, we often have to withdraw from the things that we love to do, or, you know, we we're not able to go to a party on the weekend with our friends because again, this is before COVID times, but uh, we can't go to a party with our friends because there's too much stimuli there and, and too many inputs and it makes us feel terrible. Can't go to the mall because again, it's too bright, it's too loud, right? We can't go to a hockey game. We can't play hockey or we can't play a sport because there's risk of injury. So that withdrawal or that you know lack of doing things that you like would inherently cause a little bit more stress, anxiety, low mood, that sort of thing. Um, that's the fears, distress, the worry. The media is, is you know, not the greatest place for that. And, and I loop in Google and the internet with all of that. Um, so that's, that's typically the reason for the psychological aspect. The one thing I do want to say is this good old days bias. I like to bring this up because um, people are often very hard on themselves. And the reason I say that is this. The good old, this is what the good old days bias is. If I did not have a concussion injury and I'm a quote unquote healthy person and I have my phone and I misplace it, okay? I look around for it, 20 minutes later, I find it and I say, oh, I must've just misplaced my phone there. That is, that's fine. If I go to the future and I'm a injured person with concussion and I misplace my phone, you know, I look for it 20 minutes later, I always come back to this idea like, oh, I never would have done that before my injury. I, this is, you know, so silly of me. I can't believe I'm doing things like this. Could it have been as a result of the injury? Sure, if you're, if you're having memory issues, but at the same time, it could have just been a coincidence or happen chance as well. But, you know, without a doubt, people with a concussion injury will always blame it on their injury and they're hard on themselves, right? And, and concussion, especially post-concussive syndrome is hard enough. We don't need to be uh, harder on ourselves with that. And then the endocrine system, which is basically our home hormonal system, there's some kind of weak literature out there that, that says that uh, prolonged post-concussive syndrome or uh, long-term concussion injury uh, issues can be as a result of hormonal imbalances. Again, the, the research doesn't support it too well, but there is a small body of literature out there saying that. And second impact syndrome, this is kind of a, a very hot button topic, um, especially in sports, especially in the last few years, which is great. It should be because, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the unfortunate accident we had with uh, Rowan Stringer, which led the rugby player from Ottawa, I believe, uh, that led to the implementation of Rowan's law and Rowan's day. Um, second impact syndrome is basically, there's sort of that vulnerable period after the initial injury um, usually that's 22 to 30 days and a second impact syndrome is, is basically having a second concussion within that vulnerable period. When it says modest impacts there, it may not take the same amount of force as the original concussion injury was, uh, required. And so sometimes we, we think it's such a, you know, we go back to sport too early or, you know, somebody, um, maybe goes for a walk in, in the middle of winter with ice on the ground and, and they, they slip, they fall, they kind of brush it off, but there's a potential to have a second impact syndrome after that. Uh, the big problem is that, again, in a very vanilla concussion, most symptoms will actually clear up in seven to 10 days. And if we're just using symptoms as our marker on whether somebody's to go back to sport especially, then they could be cleared after seven to 10 days. And we can see here is that the seven to 10 days is much shorter than the vulnerable period of 22 to 30 days. And that's usually how second impact syndrome happens. Although now because of all the awareness, it's, it's, uh, the management typically is better and we see less of that, but I'm sure it still happens to a certain degree. Okay. So, uh, let's just revisit these questions that we spoke about in the first place. So do you have to be hit in the head to have a concussion? And I hope that we know after what we talked about with the impulsive force that no, you don't have to know. Um, you can be hit in the rest of the body with enough of a force that it causes the whiplash mechanism to the head, the neck, that it can cause that concussion. Do you need to have loss of consciousness? Uh, no, 90 to 95% of concussion injuries happen without a loss of consciousness. Do concussions show up on x-ray, CT, or MRI? 
And again, no, uh, because those are standard imaging modalities. They take a static picture, a static 2D picture that shows structural injuries, but not functional injuries. Is there a blood? So I guess these last two I didn't really touch on. Uh, you can probably infer from a, a couple of things, but is there a blood test to confirm a concussion? So I think it was a couple of years ago now, there was something in the Toronto Star talking about, oh, you know, scientists have made this revolutionary discovery. We have a blood test to confirm a concussion. And it didn't really give the full picture because basically what they were using was, if we go back to what I was talking about, one of the theories of PCS and the inflammatory uh, origin, they were using inflammation markers as their um, metric. And so they would take a blood test, they would use a, a specific inf inflammatory marker, CRP um, or C-reactive protein, and uh, a couple of other ones as well. And they would say, oh, you have you know, evidence of this in your blood, it's likely that you had a concussion. The problem with that is that it's a very widespread marker. So it's not specific to concussion. And so you can't really pin the diagnosis on that because it could also be indicative of inflammation in another area of the body. So as of today, there is no blood test to confirm a concussion. I'm sure they're working on something like that, but again, as of today, nothing. And lastly, can a helmet or a mouth guard prevent a concussion? So you had to make a couple leaps with this one, but can a, hel a helmet or a mouth guard prevent a concussion? No, it can't. Um, are they super important to wear? I think so. Uh, helmet can prevent, you know, uh, a lot of these structural injuries that we were talking about, the fractures, um, the lacerations, the more kind of the abrasions, the surface level things. Mouth guard obviously can, can prevent uh, damage to the teeth, but because of the mechanism of the stretch and shearing of the brain, helmet or mouth guard is not going to prevent that. They're largely exterior to that in the brain. So, I don't, I, I, obviously I have kids and, you know, I, I tell all kids, I tell everybody that they should still be wearing a helmet and using a mouth guard, but the literature actually doesn't support its use as far as preventing concussions. Okay, so um, hopefully that wasn't too dry. I know that it gets a little sciencey at some parts, but I think it's important that you know some of those, uh, those basic terms and have a bit of an understanding because a lot of, of the information out there is, is either poorly delivered or, you know, it's incorrect. And so I know when I had an injury, I want to know what was, I wanted to know what was going on. And I think what I see with my practice is that when I go through a bit of a spiel like this, that, you know, it puts a lot of people's minds at ease. They know they're not broken or they're not, you know, feeling a certain way. And it's just all in their head. Like a lot of people deem it to be right. This is, it's important to know where these, these symptoms, these signs come from and what to look for in different areas of the body. So if there are any questions and we can go over them now. Just to recap, um, if you move your mouse over the screen, the menu will come up and you can type your question in the chat box and I will deliver it to Mr. or sorry, Dr. Vargo. Oh, we have a hand raised. Um, I'm wondering, oops, sorry, my mouse is a little sticky. I saw a hand raised button. Do you want to speak? Do you want to ask your question verbally? Go ahead and raise your hand again if you want to ask your question verbally and I can unmute you. Wow, flawless presentation, eh? No, no question. <laughs> <laughs> I actually found it fascinating, to be honest with you, um, without getting into too much. Um, you know, so many things actually made so much sense because yeah. it's it's almost like you simplified things, and it was like, oh my gosh, yeah, you know. Yeah, and and. You know, I alluded to it a few times that I've, I've experienced a lot of these 
injuries before. Um, mm-hmm. and so I, and I can relate to patients, I think because of that, you know, it's no one wants to be injured, but I think it was a great experience for me. And I was lucky enough that I got the right care and nothing was, you know, long-term, but I think because of that, I, I kind of know some of the stuff that are the questions that people have and what they're looking for. And like you said, I just, I try to give you enough of the science stuff to know and understand, but I don't want to overload you because this stuff goes far beyond my understanding right (laughs) but uh and and so the other thing i should say too is that this changes like by the by the week by the day probably right and so a lot of the stuff that we get in the science or sorry in the literature in the journals um is i'm sure as soon as we're reading it's already outdated right um let alone whatever you find on a on a, a website on google right so that's uh that's important to keep in mind as well but that being said, you know, I think the literature, the, the research is the best we have right now. And so we have to stay on top of, we have to use that as our source, I would think. Yes, exactly. Um, so one of our members has asked, or sorry, raised their hand. So I'm gonna go ahead and allow them to talk if that's okay with you, Sean. Yeah, yeah I'll get you yeah, for sure. Good, just in case. I know for some people it's a little challenging to uh, type. So I went ahead and I've allowed you to talk, so you can go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um, I had a couple things. Uh, one was a question was how to, um, how do you diagnose that ganglion with the C2, C3 area? Yeah. So um, not very easily. And I, I don't know, really know if it's something you have to diagnose because um, the diagnosis would still fall under, you know, concussion or PCS. Um, how do you rule it in or rule it out? It's, uh, there's a number of different sort of neurological tests, if you want to call them. So some of the base level things like looking at um, like reflexes, strength, sensation testing, also doing some what are called cranial nerve testing. So some of the nerves that uh, originate in our brain and in our neck, there's 12 special cranial nerves that sort of supply our face and head function that have routes through that ganglion, um, the the cervical ganglion there. So um, I can't say that there's something direct to assess it, but you can do enough tests around it to infer that it may be uh, involved. Who would do that? Um, Who would do that? For the, for the nerve testing, yeah. Yeah, um, so that's a good question. I think, so I, I often get that question because you know, the healthcare world is very wide and varied. And, and, you know, I think I'm a decent example of that. I'm a chiropractor, but, and most chiropractors don't work in this space. So I I think what you have to do is you have to find somebody who has experience in treating concussions, whether that's a chiropractor, whether that's a physiotherapist, whether it's, um, you know, a neurologist with a focus in this area or sports med physician, you, you just have to find somebody who specializes in this area. Um, I think that is the key because, you know, somebody who's a physio at place A versus place B, just because they have the same title, they're not going to do the same types of things. So I think it's very important that you find somebody who specializes in that area. And whether uh, I always say to patients, it doesn't matter if it's a physio or a chiro, if they're doing good work, they should be doing largely a lot of the same things. So uh, I know that's a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but it's just, you have to look at the expertise. Okay. And I just had a comment, like when you mentioned about MRIs and CT scans and such that don't um, show uh, concussions. And I agree with that, but um, I think it's important for people to know that it could show other problems that could exist like brain bleeds and stuff. So people may be avoiding those tests because they know that it may not show, but it may show other things that could be even more complicated with the concussion. I'm Guessing. Yeah, that's that's a great point, and I, I guess I should have said that. And and that was sort of the same point I had with with wearing like a helmet, right? So could it show other sinister things as far as you know a brain bleed or a fracture or you know hopefully not, but a tumor or things like that? Yeah, for sure. But specific to a concussion, no, it wouldn't be showing uh, those types of things. All right, one last question yeah. uh, was: What would be an example of a central nervous system? Um, dysfunction uh i mean there's a ton i guess because like so your central nervous system is is made up of your brain and your spinal cord Mm -hmm. so 
like something like MS is a, is a central nervous system dysfunction or a, like a condition. Um, if you're talking specific to a concussion, then it could be things like uh, balance or, or coordination issues. Like I actually just, before I hopped on here, I was working with a patient post brain injury and she has what's called cerebellar ataxia, which your cerebellum is part of your brain where uh, it, it's responsible for movement coordination. And so that is uh, indicative of a CNS dysfunction, right? It's the type of thing where, um, so one of the tests I'll tell you that I do is, you know, touch your nose then touch my finger. And so it's a coordination and a movement test. And if she was to reach for my finger, she would overshoot it or she wouldn't be able to touch it, things like that. So that's indicative of a type of CNS dysfunction. Okay. Would also dysautonomia or uh, functional neurological disorder go in those two? Yeah, it could. Um, depending on what the belief is on the origin of them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let me just, there's a question in the chat box. So one of our members has a question. Can treatment for functional abilities take care of years later? So the way I am interpreting that is that, um, you know, the injury was a number of years back. You have some uh, longstanding uh, either deficits or, or difficulties with movements um, or abilities, I guess, uh, and can rehab after a number of years still um, assist you. And again, I'm going to have to say it depends. Um, I think the majority of people it can. Um, I think it's always uh, a matter of what the assessment says, though, um, where the the deficit in abilities lie, um, where uh, is it a strength issue? Is it a conditioning issue? Is it, um, you know, something where rehab will help? And it, I, I don't think that matters temporally if it's um, a strength endurance training type issue if it's something where it's neurological in nature and there's damage or issues with you know a neurological structure again without knowing the specifics then it may be a little bit more difficult to to uh to remedy or to rehab i guess thank you um another question is what are the tests that could show the functionality or lack of to indicate concussion or PCS? Um, so the way I interpret that is the difference between concussion versus PCS, the tests for that. Is that right? I haven't had a response. Okay. Um, but I'm wondering, and this is me just um, trying to interpret, so feel free to correct us. Um, but I'm wondering if it's a general question of is, are, are there tests or what are the tests um, that could indicate um, concussion or PCS? So um, I'll tell you, every, so everybody has their, will have their own kind of battery of tests that they use from an assessment perspective. I'll tell you what I do, because um, I think I work with, um, we work with a couple of neurologists and sports medicine physicians. And so this has been put together in consultation with them. Okay. So this isn't just me. This is also some of the, some pretty good physicians. What we do is that we, we do a cognitive screening. Okay. And whether that's using uh, kind of a tablet based test or some other kind of pen and paper tests, we, we include cognitive testing. We include uh, neurological testing, which I alluded to earlier. So it's it's going to be um, reflexes, strength testing, sensation testing, cranial nerve testing, or the nerves of the head and the neck, balance, coordination, um, and something called a VOMS, which is basically it's called a it stands for vestibulo-oculomotor screen, and so that's kind of a movement of the head and the neck. Um, then I will assess the neck. Uh, specifically, so the muscles, bones, joints, nerves of the neck. And then um, I will also look at, at sort of neck positioning and neck movements, a special test called cervical proprioception. So that is what the kind of standard 
concussion test looks for looks like on our end, whether that's acute concussion or whether that's um, post concussion syndrome. It varies a little bit because the presentation is a little bit different, but that's what our testing looks like. On top of that, we're also going to do, um, we have a bit of a conversation about things where in your daily life, like where are you struggling, right? Because while it's all well and good to have this technical jargon, these, these you know, advanced assessments or whatever, if it doesn't translate to your everyday life and make an impact for you functionally, then, you know, a patient's not going to buy in and they're not going to want to do all the rehab that we, that we prescribe. Right. So we have to look at how it's affecting you and your day to day. And, and, you know, we have to take that into account as well. Mm -hmm. Another question from a member is uh, regarding the myelin sheath. Was that the gray matter or the white matter? Uh, the gray matter contains the myelin. Thank you to everyone who is asked questions or um, commented. Uh, there was another comment actually about your presentation. They said that they'd agreed with me that your presentation was not dry. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I'm very happy. And sorry, I just, I just realized, I mean, it's the white matter that contains the myelin. Sorry, I was just thinking through that, yeah. <laughs> just as you're complimenting my presentation, I realized. <laughs> No, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. That's, uh, that's good. I love talking about this. And I, I, like I said at the beginning of this, I love giving this presentation because uh, I, I think that it's, it's good information for people to know because I've been there and this is the type of stuff that I wouldn't want to be knowing. So. Yeah, I think it's um, like almost two parts where, first of all, having the information delivered from someone who understands it at a more personal level, who's experienced it, really does just ring differently. Um, and uh, also to just getting a better understanding of our bodies, of our brains and how they function gives us, I think, a sense of um, understanding of the steps of our own rehab. Um, and so it's just, it's kind of empowering, you know, especially when a lot of people are facing these words that they've never come across, because generally we don't. Um, you know, it's either that it's working good or it's needs some work and we don't really get a lot of information beyond that. And so it can be a little bit um, disconcerting when you first uh, start talking to medical professionals. Yeah. And, and that is one of my gripes is that I find um, that there's a lot like there's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of technical terminology and a lot of times uh, healthcare providers don't take the time to explain what those words mean. And then it becomes this scary foreign idea to the patient. And, you know, I, I think if they just took the time to explain what it means, it, it kind of, it takes away the, the stigma of concussion. It takes away the lack of understanding and it, it just gives you, it, it reduces the anxiety. It gives you that, that sense that, okay, I know what's going to happen. I know why we're doing this rehab and what it's going to do. And I can see a path to recovery, right? Yes. So. A few more comments. Um, so in regards to the, uh, the question around the parts of the brain, um, the member said, sure, just checking. Um, <laughs> and then another member said, very clear presentation and understandable. And they said, thank you. Awesome. I'm, I'm very glad to hear. I think we're all in agreement. All right. So, um, you won't see me for a couple of weeks, but uh, like I said, our, our next, I believe our next presentation is by our occupational therapist on pacing, planning and fatigue management, which is always a very good topic to discuss in uh, this space. Uh, so you should tune in for that because she's also a great speaker as well, so. Thank you, Sean. And we have a lot of other thanks coming in the, the chat box. Great. I'm going to uh, end the, the recording now. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for attending tonight, all of our members. And I also wanted to thank um, the Dr. Gargum and uh, our very own Lara Fitzgerald Hushek for attending tonight. Thank you so much for your time and delivering such an informative and I think dynamic uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Take care, guys.